Hello everyone, I'm Sean Levick from the Geospatial Ecology and Remote Sensing Lab. This is our environmental monitoring and modeling course, and today we're moving on to Lab 8, Mapping and Monitoring Surface Water Availability from Space. Managing water resources requires spatially explicit knowledge of where water is located in the landscape and of how it varies over time. The objective of this lab is to map the presence of surface water from space and calculate the inundation frequency of different water bodies. I'd like to acknowledge the Google Earth Engine team and the server Mekong project who are working together with USAID, NASA, Windrock International and the ADPC have developed a great suite of scripts for mapping surface water availability and inundation. The scripts below are modified versions of their work in the Mekong Delta. Today we will be making use of the Landsat 8 Top of Atmosphere Tier 1 collection. This is the Google Earth Engine catalog ID. And as usual, we'll be working within the Google Earth Engine environment. So I'd like you to head over to a fresh, um, fresh instance of Google Earth Engine. Um, if you have an existing script, just clear it using the reset script button over here. And up in the search bar <coughs> there, type in Landsat 8 TOA. And remember that if you click on that, you'll see some information about the collection that we're using. Important to note is the data availability. 11th of April 2013 until present time. Um, we will be working with a 30 meter product. There are some, the, the panchromatic band, band 8 is at 15 meters. Okay, we don't need to import it. We, we can import it here or here, but we're just going to call it up in our script. Do that we can copy out this code snippet paste it in here and if we hit run you'll see that we're defining a variable called landsat 8 and that's calling the earth engine image collection with that id okay um, where will we be working for today we're going to work in an area of new south wales australia Menindee Lakes. It's been in the news quite a lot over the last year. Uh, a lot of fish death occurring in those lakes. Uh, located between Broken Hill and Ivanhoe. So the easiest way to navigate there would <coughs> be to type in Broken Hill and uh, click on that. Broken Hill, New South Wales, Australia. That'll bring us down to this area of New South Wales. And you can see Broken Hill here, Ivanhoe there, and these are the lakes that, that we'll be working on. And indeed, remember that you can flick over to the high resolution um, satellite base map to get an idea of this landscape. So, very arid region. You can see the river channel here um, and a couple of uh, lakes lying off to the side. Um, interesting area, a lot of interesting agriculture taking place. You can see in this one lake over here, it looks like um, uh, probably cotton growing in there. Now, um, if we want to be able to understand the water surface dynamics, we are going to start by filtering our Landsat 8 collection. So we're going to copy this script over here and this is fairly similar to what we've done before in the course to date. A slight difference, just a little bit more efficient, redefining a start date and an end date up front and then I'm calling those in the in the filter date section. So instead of typing out the dates here we can just use start date, end date. So we're making a variable called L8 images, Landsat 8 images, and they're going to come from the collection 
but we're going to filter by date and filter by bounds. Now remember when we filter by bounds we are restricting our search to a particular geographic region and that references an ROI, region of interest, which we haven't yet uh, drawn in. So we can head over here to the geometry tools, choose a rectangle and then just draw the rectangle over the area that we are interested in. Remember to rename the default geometry name to ROI so that the reference in our script will be that. Okay, now the next step is to mask out our clouds and this is a nice piece of code. It's not one that we've used before. It relies on a particular Earth Engine algorithm specifically for Landsat imagery using a simple cloud score. You'll see that we also define a cloudiness threshold and we effectively call anything cloudy if, if it exceeds the cloud threshold. So this is a function to map um, a cloud mask over Landsat 8 imagery. We then apply that mask to our collection and then we're going to map out the, the median of the stack. So that's just a visual. Um, we're going to use a false color composite. So this will be the median value over the time period uh, on a per pixel basis having previously marked out, masked out the clouds. So we need a copy in this piece of code to mask our clouds. And we need this piece to apply the mask and plot the false color image. So let's run that. Um, and check the console for any errors. We can see that that layer has been added to our layers tab and this is the progress bar. It'll take a little bit of time remembering that we have clipped this to our ROI over here. Um, just to note this map center object command that centers the map on our ROI and I've put in a scale factor of 8 here. The scale factor runs from, from one, um, 1 to 22 um, with 1 being effectively the whole globe and 22 being zoomed in very fine. Let's come in a bit closer have a look at this area. We can flick to the, the backdrop, the satellite backdrop and it takes a little while to load up Here's the base map image, and here comes our Landsat 8 false color composite on top. And once that layer has loaded up, we see it over here. Um, the median composites are a very nice way of looking at the average or the, the median pixel value over a long time. It gives a very clear, crisp image. We have also applied the cloud function. So this gives us a view of we can well we can see those some of the lakes standing out very clearly some would appear to be deeper than others but how would we quantitatively map out water and I'll just flick that backdrop map off again so that you can see the the clipped image that we're working with now to actually map the surface water, we're going to make use of the normalized difference water index. Um, we've worked with the normalized difference vegetation index in the past using the near infrared and the red band. The NDWI index uses the is the ratio of the green band to the near infrared. Now it uses this equation here um, green minus near infrared divided by green plus near infrared. This code 
section is in three parts. Firstly, up here, we will create a function to calculate NDWI using the normalized difference uh, function. We will then, we, and we're creating a function called add NDWI. We will then add that to our collection. So we're going to create a variable Landsat 8 NDWI. We'll also filter by bounds and date. We'll apply our previous cloud function. We'll pull out bands 3 and 5 and then add NDWI. We will then map this out spatially um, using map add layer and we're going to choose the max NDWI because we want to know every pixel that has contained water over our time period. So I'm going to copy that, paste it in here, and hit run. It will take a little time to load. And you'll see now that we have two layers in our Layers tab, NDWI and the Landsat 8 False Color Median. Once our layer has loaded up, we can zoom in a bit closer. And if we turn off the Landsat False Color Median and head over to the satellite backdrop, you will see only pixels that have been classified as water appearing in blue on our image. And this is really what we want. Um, this maps out all the pixels that have contained surface water as defined by um, NDWI over our time period. Bearing in mind that this is for the 2013 to 2019 period. I'm using 2013 as a starting date because that's when Landsat 8 imagery is available from. Now, this is great for knowing the, the maximum extent of water over our time period, uh, at least from dates in which the Landsat imagery was collected. But we might want to know the pattern for a single year. And that's our next step. We're going to choose a single year and make an NDWI map using 2008 as an example. So this is the bit of code here. Um, defining dates, we're going to clip to the same ROI and name the layer 2018. Copy that. It's applying the same procedure as above, but importantly we're restricting our dates. So the way it's set up here is that we can easily change the year that will be placed in here. So we're going from the 1st of 2018 to the end of 2018. When I hit run now, we'll have three layers in our Layers tab. Um, our Landsat false color median at the bottom, our NDWI for our full time series, and our NDWI just for 2018. Now, once these layers have all loaded up, can zoom in a little bit closer. Um, I want you to switch off the 2018 layer. So let's or rather let's switch off all layers. Only turn on the new 2018 layer. And as that comes through, we can see the, the difference to the full time series. So in our full time series from 2017, uh, Lake Menendi was mapped as having water, but in 2018 um, the lake was is shown here as being dry. So that shows the difference between a single year time series and the longer five year time series that we have at our disposal. Now a very nice way of visualizing this more quantitatively is to develop inundation frequency maps. And we can do that using just a few lines of code. What we're going to do is, is map out for, 
for each year um, the pixels that are that represent surface water as defined from NDWI. We are then going to um, count for, on a per pixel basis. We will sum, so we'll assign a value of one to every pixel that contains water. We'll stack the full collection. And then for every year, we're going to sum the, the number of pixels that have contained water. And we will then divide by the total count of, of how many images we've had over the period. And that will give us the inundation frequency. So a couple of things here. We want to develop this frequency. We're going to sum the binary values and divide by the binary count and map that out on a scale going from white through magenta blue to dark blue, adding a layer called water inundation frequency. Add that piece in. I'm going to change my scale here. Earlier where we put that eight, I'm going to come in a little bit closer. I'm going to try ten. Hit run. And these will take a little while to load. But you can see in the layer tab that we now have four layers with the water inundation frequency on top. I'm going to turn off the other ones. Remember that if we if we don't want these to be automatically populated, at the end of the map layer map add layer commands, we can uh, include a false. So just like this, type false, and that will then prevent the layer from automatically turning on. Here we are starting to see our inundation frequency map turning up and we can see very nicely here that some lakes are inundated more frequently than others. Um, just put on that satellite backdrop again. So if the pink magenta areas are not inundated as frequently as the dark blue areas. We can use the inspector to have a look at that. If we look at this little lake over here um, the water inundation frequency is 93 percent over the five-year period whereas this lake over here inundation frequency is only 33 percent okay now again being earth engine it's a very flexible tool so if we turn our ROI back on again. You can click on this box, carry it anywhere in Australia, anywhere in the world for that fact, run it again and see what interesting patterns you can find. So that brings us to the end of our lab eight. Exercise for today is to move your region of interest around different parts of Australia and explore how different how current drought conditions are affecting dam levels in different parts of the country. I also want you to think about how you might go expanding the time series further back in time. Say we wanted to go further back than, than five years. How would we do that? All right. Um, tomorrow we move on to Lab 9 in our Environmental Monitoring and Modeling course. I'm Sean Levick from the Geospatial Ecology and Remote Sensing Lab. Hope you found that useful. Cheers. <music>